I just spared this flight here that's uh, getting ready to big angle to take off. It's, uh, we've got over 50 airplanes involved in this strike force, and it was uh, going to be a big raid up near the Hanoi area, but the weather's bad. Now they're going to various other areas. A spare's job. For every four airplanes we launch, we launch one spare off the end of the runway. In case one of the airplanes that we're having trouble with, they can fill in uh, in any four positions, any one of the four positions. He can be usually a leader, so in case the leader aboards, he can uh, fill in that spot. You can see this flight taking off now, and then the airplane standing by is the spare. He'll be uh, coming back up like me probably pretty soon. Okay, my name is David B. Waldrop, W-A-L-D-R-O-P. So I was a first lieutenant when I served, did my combat tour in Vietnam. I actually flew out of Thailand at both Karat and Takali. I started at Takali, I was TDY from Yakota, but I was a first lieutenant my entire tour. I was uh, fortunate enough to uh, be born and raised in Nashville, Tennessee which I think is one of the greatest places in the world, especially in the 50s when I was actually growing up. You know, Nashville was a city. Uh, it had everything to offer that cities have, but yet just a little outside of town, it was rural. And my dad used to raise hunting dogs, bird dogs specifically, and we used to hunt and fish. And, and back then, you know, I could, even as a, as a young kid, I mean, I could, when I, when I started driving, I could knock on a farmer's door and, and say, sir, do you mind if I go hunting on your place? And he'd take a good look at you and he said, do you know how to, how to hunt? you know how to handle a gun? I said, yes, sir. My dad taught me well. And he said, well, you're not going to shoot any of my animals, are you? And I said, no, sir, that's not what I'm here to, here to hunt. I'm ready. To, I want to hunt some quail. And, you know, and they, would, they would let you do it. You think about doing that today, forget it. But uh, I grew up there, and, and uh, it, was, it was an awesome place to grow up. And, uh, you know, we could go outside. When we were, even when we were little kids before we started driving, and everything, you'd go out on the weekends and stuff like that. Your mom and dad wouldn't see you all day long, but they weren't, weren't worried about you. You know, we were safe. And we'd wander all over the place. We'd spend more time outside because we didn't have video games and TVs even hardly back then. And so we were outside all the time, and uh, usually barefooted. And uh, so it was, it was an awesome time. And it was, I, and looking back, especially now, it was an innocent period of time. You, you didn't have the preponderance of crime and all the social issues that, otherwise the social aspect of things was, was great. And it was a safe place. And you felt secure. And it, it, you felt comfortable. So yeah, it was a great place to grow up. I went to Hillsborough High School, which was just, that was another great place because uh, it, it was a good school, the teachers were good, and we, we didn't have a lot of kids that were mean or anything like that at school. It was a big school too. And uh, so that was, that, was, that was a great part. And then I tried to play football and my dad, actually, he used to play on one of those local teams, and I've got a picture somewhere, I wish I could find it, I've looked for it, showing this, this cast of characters. And I mean, these are guys that you wouldn't, wouldn't want to come up against on a football field. And I mean, they had the old leather helmets, and they, they take, took a, a team picture after a game, and I mean, they were nasty, covered with mud, and they looked the part. And 
you know, I always, and dad wanted me to play football, of course, that's just what dads, you know, do with their sons, and, and I wanted to play. But I weighed all about 120 pounds when I started high school. I was a skinny mini, and I'm still not very big. And uh, I'd go out there and, and you know, they say, oh, you gotta hit the big guys low, you know, and I'd run as hard as I could. I'd try to hit, the, we had a fullback that weighed 220 pounds. And I'd try to hit that guy when he's doing an in-sweep, and I'd bounce off him like a little dog. <laughs> you know, just, but it was just, I said, good Lord, give me some weight, something to work with. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, that, that, so I didn't become a big football star, as you can well imagine. But I did try. And uh, so, you know, I, 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 we did all the swimming and the fishing and skiing. And we had a lot of lakes around Nashville. And uh, a buddy of mine and myself, we used to go duck hunting by ourselves. At 16 years old, we'd get up at 3 o'clock in the morning on our Christmas break from, high, from school. And, you know tow a boat down to uh, Kentucky Lake, which is about 70 miles away from Nashville. You're 16 years old. Do parents let their kids do that kind of stuff today? I don't think so. And then, and we'd go out there and hunt ducks. And we'd find ducks. And the ducks would come to us. We'd actually call them in and everything. We'd. I remember one time we went down there. I know this is probably going to be long winter, but we went down there. It was so cold. It had, one of those fronts came through. We had a, a a boat and the water, because it rained first, and then then one of these flash freezes came in and dropped down about 20 degrees. The boat froze to the trailer, so we get down there and back up trying to get this boat off the trailer. It won't come off; it's frozen to the trailer. And I pull my my pants off, and my boots off, and I walked out in this ice water, and literally rocked the boat and finally broke it loose. <laughs> and it's just what we did. And so it was, it was great. And you know, we were, we were, I was, I had my first shotgun, I think when I was 13 years old. And uh, it was just, it was just a different time. But it was great. It was fantastic. TV came about probably, I guess, when I was uh, somewhere in grammar school. And we had a, one of the stations in Nashville there was only three at that time. Uh, used to close out their evening broadcast at 11 o'clock at night with uh, the poem High Flight. slept the surly bonds of earth and danced the skies on laughter silvered wings sunward I've climbed and joined the tumbling mirth of sun split clouds and done a hundred things you have not dreamed of wheeled and soared and swung high in the sunlit silence Hovering there, I've chased the shouting wind along and flung my eager craft through footless halls of air. Up, up the long, delirious, burning blue, I've topped the windswept heights with easy grace when never lark nor even eagle flew. And while with silent, lifting mind, I've trod the high, untrespassed sanctity of space. Put out my hand and touch the face of God. With a 104 in the background doing rolls and just the clouds, and I mean, that just... It just grabbed me. Plus, we had a uh, we had a 
a guard unit that was flying F-84s, and although we weren't really near the airport, their pattern would take them pretty near our house, and they'd be in fingertip formation, you know, you'd see those guys, and I look up and God, that's so cool. And nobody in my family had ever even set foot in an airplane. But that was it. When I was 16, I decided I was going to be a single seat fighter pilot, flying in the Air Force. Not the Navy, not the Marines. I didn't even know the Marines had airplanes, actually. But not in the Navy, but the Air Force. That's just what I decided I was going to do. And so I pretty well oriented everything I did from that point forward to go that direction. And I got accepted to Vanderbilt University. Now, I'm not the brightest candle on the cake by any means, which Vanderbilt's a pretty tough school, but I did get accepted, barely. But they had naval ROTC. Well, that wasn't what I wanted. I wanted to fly in the Air Force. And so I knew, you know, I, I did enough research, and I found out that what, what I had to do is become come out of college with a degree, and the best way to do it would be to go through ROTC so you come out as an officer. Because I, I did talk to some, uh, some, uh, I guess, counselors that, that, that knew. And so I said, I'm going to University of Tennessee. Well, that saved mom and dad a lot of money because Vanderbilt was a private university. Although, of course, I was living off, on, off away from home, but that was also good. <laughs> and so I went to University of Tennessee. And once again, I could not have picked a better school for David Walter. But actually, I went by the name Barry because my dad was called David. His dad was David. And so they call me B for Barry. That's, that's what the B stands for in my name. And so I grew up being that. And so I went to University of Tennessee and that was the best thing that ever happened to me. I, I met some of the greatest guys who I still keep up with to the day, this day. And we get together every once in a while for reunions. I was in a fraternity up there. And that also was really, really, that was a maturing actually, actual experience. Uh, Cause there were certain roles of leadership that you could actually assume by being in a fraternity, which I did. And I was never president or anything like that, but I, I, I did several different things that, that allowed me to, to grow up and mature in that respect. And so I, I had a lot of fun up there. In fact, I had so much fun, I spent two extra quarters before I could graduate. <laughs> and, uh, but then finally, you know, I was, I was ready to get on, I was just, I was ready to go start flying airplanes. And, I, and of course, I, I was very lucky. This is something also that's very important. To be medically fit to get a pilot slot in the military was, was really a critical and non-negotiable aspect of, of getting into a, a pilot's slot. Fortunately, I was medically completely fit. My eyes, my hearing, and everything, all that was, was satisfactory, so I was able to get a slot in uh, pilot training and I passed all the appropriate tests and so forth. So that's, you know, when I extended and stayed in ROTC, at that time, every male had to go through two years of ROTC at University of Tennessee. At University of Tennessee. No choices. That's just the rules. But then if you want to stay on as, and get your officer's slot, then you had, to, you know, the third and fourth year, you also had to be in ROTC. And so that's what I did. And uh, one of the guys in my fraternity was in ROTC, and so he started flying with me when I was a freshman. And I, I was able to start getting a little bit of stick time and uh, getting the feel of it. And I knew that, yeah, yeah I, you, you, you made the right choice because that's the first time I flew in an airplane. And uh, I, I, even though I'd never been in an airplane, I knew that this was it. I mean, I, I'd get up there and, that, boy, the exhilaration and the excitement and just the the feeling of, of making that airplane do something while you're up in the sky was fantastic. And so anyway, then your, your junior year, well, actually your senior year, you go to a, a, a six-week military camp your junior year, but then if you're a pilot candidate, then your senior year, they would send you to a local airport where you'd actually learn to fly and get your wings. You know, not your wings, military wings, but you'd get you know, a pilot's license. And that was, I got about 35 hours there and got my pilot's license and 
I remember one time we, we, we had a little airplane that's called a Shin 2150, which was a tandem seat. You sit one behind there. It looked like a miniature T-34. And I thought that airplane was just so cool. And I went up and I'd fly it. And I went up one day by myself and I did something I shouldn't have done, but I did it anyway. And because our, our commandant of, of cadets for the, for the ROTC unit, They'd bring a T-33 jet trainer up periodically. It was it was sat it was you know tandem seat also, and and I got a, got to ride in it a few times. And of course he always would do a roll, and do some maneuvering and stuff like that. And I thought that was cool. So I get in this little shin one day, and I said, you know, I'm gonna do one of those rolls. So I pull. I didn't have a clue how to do a roll, and I sort of pull the nose up a little bit, and I start put I put the stick over, and of course in an airplane. When you, once you get sort of like this, the nose is going to want to drop. And it did. And I so I kept on, here I am going straight down at the ground. I'm doing, I'm seeing the red line. I said, oh my God. And I started pulling the G's. I felt the G's. That was cool. I like that. But I said, that probably, I ought to find out how to do this first. So I do it again. <laughs> so I went in and, talk, and I talked to uh, Colonel White and uh I said, by the way, you remember when you did that roll? How did, how did, you, how did you do that? And so he, he started telling me, he said, no, no, you, you. I said, well, it, it, I, I wound up, <laughs> he said, oh my God, don't do that anymore. That airplane's not even aerobatic. You're not even supposed to do aerobatics in that airplane. I said, oh, really? So I said, okay. <laughs> so, anyway, I didn't do any more of those, but, uh, and then, of course, finally I graduated in December 1964. I was supposed to have, and this is sort of how, I, was, I had a lot of luck when I was in the military. And I really did, in a lot of places, a lot of different times. I was supposed to have a March class in the Air Force, to go to pilot training. So I was going to, I graduated in December, I was going to go home and I wouldn't report to the Laughlin Air Force Base till March. And I about drove Colonel White crazy. I said, sir, I'm ready to go now. I've, I've been waiting for this all my life. And he said, well, I, you know, they, they come up with these assignments and everything. They, they, you gotta just take what they give you. And I said, can you just talk to somebody, please? And so he's said, okay, okay, I'll, I'll do my best. Well, damn if he didn't go talk to somebody and I got a January class. So I, I wound up going in and here's the irony of the thing. I wound up going in in January, starting pilot training, the March class, and I got a, I, I can go into more detail, but I got an F-105 assignment. I had to work my ass off, but I got an F-105, which I wanted a single seat fighter, and that was one of the two airplanes that I wanted to fly when I was 16 years old. And uh, the March class, they didn't have any 105s. Oh, it, oh yeah, I mean, no, you'll never know how it changed my life. It, I mean, it completely oriented my entire life. And uh, that was sort of interesting also when I was at pilot training. I'll skip the first part because it's T-37s. Everybody goes through the T-37s. But then a good friend of mine was a fellow named Pete Foley. He was in six weeks, six months ahead of me. So in other words, we were going like this, so I we, I go where he leaves. So, no, he was not, but he was he. Uh, but he got an F-105 assignment also, and his instructor was a fellow named Chris Paterakis. And Chris Paterakis was a guard guy that had come on back on active duty that used to fly fighters in the guard. So I mean, he was he was the real deal. And so Chris, I mean, Pete told me he when we we got to be really good friends. He said, Dave, you want you want fighters, you want an F-105 or an F-100. You got to get Chris as your instructor, and you're going to be taking our place. Let me introduce you to Chris, and maybe he can get you as his student. So he did, and so Chris did get me as one of his students. Well, the first thing an instructor does when they they start out in flight training is they they will sit down e individually student instructor by themselves and say what do you want out of this what what's what's your goal of course chris already knew what mine was because i had met him and pete had introduced me he told him this guy wants fighters as bad as i did well but when we sat down what he said to me was he said i already know what you want that's easy to say you want something 
Now is when the test starts because you're going to have to back it up. Because I, the other two guys, they really don't care what they get. They just want to get their wings. But you want something. And I'm going to be on your back 100% of the time. Nothing is ever going to be good enough. And you're going to have to work harder than anybody in this whole squadron. Are you willing to do that? I said, yes, sir. And I did. If I was 10 feet off, Dave, what's wrong with your altitude? Well, I'm, I'm working back to it. I mean, that's what it was the whole time. And finally, at one time, the Coupe de Gras sort of, sort of came after we did our formation and so forth. I remember one time I, I, I was leading and, and, you know, you'd fly solo and I was leading back into the formation. And they had turned the airport around because of wind changes while we were out. And I didn't know it and I didn't get the information correctly. So I'm leading back the same way we started out. And all of a sudden over there, I've got the flight. Get on my wing. So I hopped on his wing. We go back out, re enter us. Oh my God. We got on the ground, and I mean, Chris walked over with my airplane, and it was all, everybody on the flight line could hear Chris just absolutely wearing me out all the way back in. Of course, I got a big old pink on that ride, too. But my formation was good. And I, had, I was doing a night formation sortie, and uh, the, the, Wing commander at Laughlin and the squadron commander needed a night formation ride. So Chris set it up so that I did my solo ride with them. Now, when I was flying with Chris, we sort of were doing some pretty good, we were doing 90 degree wing overs. More than, 45 was all you're supposed to be doing. We were doing 90 degree wing overs and I'm hanging right in there. And, and Chris was just, he just, he was absolute Adam, but smooth, smooth, smooth. If you're, if you've got somebody in your wing, this is what I've learned to fly formation. He said, don't ever let them know they're even a turn. Make it so smooth. They don't even know they've started a turn. You know, you just, just, he said, just, that's the whole key. And so I get ready for this night formation ride. And, and Chris says, Dave, I want you to do exactly what we were doing the other day. And I said, sir, it's night. And I said, besides, we were supposed to be doing 45. He said, if they don't come back with their flight suits soaking wet, I'm going to pink you. And of course, it was a full moon. And, I, and he said, it's a full moon. You'll, nobody will have any trouble seeing each other. So I went up, and I mean, here we are, night. <laughs> night degree wiggles. And we get back on the ground, and I, I got in, in the room, and I, I saw Chris and he said, well, did you? I said, well, I did what you told me, sir. So I'm standing about as far as me to Scott from Chris and those two characters walked in. Characters, they were full colonel and a light lieutenant colonel. They walk in and they stop right in the doorway and they look at Chris and they looked over at me and one guy didn't even turn his head, he just looked back at Chris. Did you put him up to that? Chris said, oh God, Dave, what did you do? And I said, I said, I just, I flew like you told me to do, sir. <laughs> and, 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 and Redwine, who was the squadron commander, started laughing. He said, I think I have seen it all now. That's the first time I have done 90 degree wing overs at night on some brand new pilot's wings. And I passed. Anyway, that, uh, the, the formation night flight was toward, toward the end, and, and at that point in time, I had my F-105 assignment. And that was one thing that, that uh, Colonel Redwine said, what, what, what kind of assignment did you get? And I said, I got an F-105, sir. And he said, well, you ought to do well. And uh, we graduated, we started in January of 65. I graduated in February of 66. And then, uh, we had, back then, they used to group all the students from all the different training bases into one big list. And they all, everybody was ranked according to their, their ranking and also what their instructor, their recommendations, uh, and so forth. And so anyway, they had six F-105s, 
and had five F-100s. Now those were the only single seat fighters that we had. So we had 11 single seat fighters and there were 225 students. So Chris got me my single seat fighter. And I went to Nellis and our, my class though didn't start till May. So I had really February to May, I wound up going to survival school up at, Nell up at uh, Reno at Stead Air Force Base, which was great since all, most all of us were going to Vietnam. So we have a, a February Stead survival school and we had to wear snowshoes. That somehow or another going to Vietnam with snowshoes didn't seem like the right program, but that's what we did anyway. And so uh, I would, you, you could, most of us were hopping backseat rides with instructors, uh, which you could do. And then you got, got you familiar with it, started getting you familiar with the airplane, that giant airplane. And, uh, and our class started in May, I think it was, uh, of 66. And, you know, uh, my, and now here's another interesting. So I had Chris Paterakis. By the way, what I didn't say about Chris Paterakis is this. He applied to the Thunderbirds while I was his student. Well, the 1st of January, he left me as my instructor and he went to the Thunderbirds. He got selected to fly a left wing on the Thunderbirds. So you can get a little bit of an idea of the mentality, the demand for perfection, the absolute acceptance of, of nothing outside the box. It had to, it had to be in a, constantly the best of the best. Well, I go to Nellis and I get an instructor who doesn't have the same uniform as the rest of the Air Force guys. He's a Navy exchange pilot by the name of Harley H. Hall. And I'll, I'll just, I'll tell you, then I'll, I'll give you the rest of the story. When I'm out there just starting formation flying with Harley, over the air for everyone in the world that's on the frequency to hear, Dave, smooth, smooth, smooth as the skin on a maiden's breast. Every fighter pilot that was on that frequency, of course, had to chime in and jump in on top of Harley. But you know what Harley later became? Blue Angel lead. Oh yeah, we we were we lived off base. We had a we, I was living in an apartment right off the strip. Wow. <laughs> I tell you what, for for a bachelor in Las, the only problem was I didn't have any money. I had a I had a red Corvette and a third of my paycheck, and I mean one third of my paycheck was going to my car payment. But I had my little red Corvette. <laughs> I mean, you know, you, yeah, I was a fighter pilot. You know, you got to do what you got to do. You know, you can't drive old junk heap around <laughs> that's it was uh that was that was and of course at that point it was it was everything Nellis had ever 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 been because Vietnam was, was full board and so everything we did and and we flew when when I was learning to fly I mean they had they were they they were pushing and we were we were getting really aggressive we were getting low we were getting fast we were getting demand they were they were pushing us as far as we could go as students because they had to get us ready because most of the guys were going straight to Vietnam and at the, the 105 used to be it was so complex and so fast in fact the, the final pro speed on the 105 on the single seat model was 185 knots now that's basic plus fuel five knots per thousand 1500 pounds of fuel over a thousand so you were you were coming down the final about 190 knots that's over 200 miles an hour. It's the fastest landing airplane we had in inventory. And at one time, you had to have 500 hours of tactical fighter time to get in the 105 because it was so complex. Because it had terrain following radar. It had a fire control system that was extremely capable, but is also very complicated. And so they, a guy like me, back in the early days, I wouldn't have even been able to get a 105 sign. But Vietnam changed everything because then they needed to bring in fresh blood. They needed to bring up guys. So those of us that instructors felt could handle the airplane got, got to have the opportunity to fly it. Best thing that ever happened to me. Actually, my whole class 
got orders to go to Yokota Air Base. And we all thought, well, gosh, we were, I thought we were going to war. And we had six guys in my class, and all of us went to Yokota. And that was because they needed to fill in Yokota, which had a nuke alert commitment. And uh, they had to keep that fully manned. It's the best thing, once again, that ever happened to me. Because when I got over to Yokota, I wound up in the 35th Squadron, and there was a, a captain there by the name of Robert Spielman. Call him Spiels. And he was, he, was fra he, he was sort of a, a country guy also in terms of he liked to hunt and fish. And so we just hit it off, and we, they had a couple of motorcycles there, and so we started, started riding motorcycles together, and, and we, we got to be really good friends, and, and he was a weapons officer. So he, we would fly a lot together simply because he could fly with me. And once again, I mean, he just pushed, he pushed, he pushed. He let me lead, and when I, lead, lieutenants were not even supposed to be leading, but when I was with him, he would always make me lead part of the flight, get on the wing, and he would always maneuver, always maneuvering the airplane, always working me out. And uh, he let me do stuff that none of the other lieutenants over there even got to do. And I know one time we were, lieutenants were never supposed to ferry an airplane solo from Osan, which is where we did our, Osan, Korea, which is where we did our new commitment. And so we were gonna come back together. Uh, there was two airplanes that needed to come back to Yokota. So I was in one airplane, he was in another one. We'd get up, fire up, and get ready to go. And his airplane goes down. Now, he's supposed to have cut me off at the same time. He didn't. He said, Dave, we need to get that airplane on back. I'll take the heat. So I took it on back. Well, halfway back to Yokota, I had a complete electrical failure. Here I am by myself at night, and I have a complete electrical failure. And we had, it wasn't an overcast. It was, so it was, it was, you know, I didn't have a visibility problem. So I wound up bringing the airplane back to Yokota by myself, had stuck a, a pit, little pistol flashlight up in my helmet to shine on my, my instruments that I could, we had standby instruments over on the right side of the, of the uh, our, our main instruments, they were gone. But we had a little standbys. So I got back to Yokota with the airplane and, uh, Spills never, never anything ever came of it, because they didn't really the the head guys never knew about what took place. Other than you know one one came back with an electrical failure. That's all they knew. But Spill said, "I knew you could do it." I said, "I wasn't planning to do it this way, though, sir." And we went out one day on a on a dart mission. In fact, right before I went to Vietnam. And this was sort of interesting too. I was flying number two on Spills's wing. A dart. Do you know what a dart is? It it's it's a it's a it's a long silver winged device that is towed behind another airplane. In our case, we towed it with a 105. And they would let the dart out, and then when he starts to turn, he'd clear you in, because he wants to be out of the line of fire. You'd be off to the, for instance, like on the right side, he'd start a, a right-hand turn, so he's clearing. Well, then you shoot it, you come in, roll in on this dart, and you shoot at it to, to, to ch you know, learn how to air to air shoot and it's hard it's not easy it's, it's not a real big target so Spills went in and he didn't hit it and so I came in and blew it away I come off and get on his wing we had two other guys and one of them was the fifth air force one of his the colonels Colonel Batzel actually was his name and he was flying uh, number four well number three comes in he fires didn't hit it well, well, they had a dart spare. I'm sorry. I hit one, that, then they had to dispatch that one. They had a dart spare airplane, because this was real critical. We all got, got our, our uh, air to air renewals. And so they brought in the, uh, the spare. So number three goes in. He didn't hit it. Number four went in, and his gun jammed, so he didn't hit it. And so Spill says, well, we still got a dart. I'm, I'm fired out. Anybody got anything? And so I waited, because I'd already got a dart. And he said, Dave, how about you? And I said, well, I might have something left. He said, go for it. I went in and I, and I did press. And I hit that thing and I mean, it literally just it exploded. And I, would, I did, had a high G over the top over the thing. We got back on the ground and, 
and Colonel Batzel said, you are really pressing on that, on that target. And before I even had a chance to open up spills, I said, sir, this is one of the things we've been trying to ingrain and teach into, into our drivers is sometimes they're gonna have a close in shot and they need to have the flexibility and be prepared to handle these situations. So I got two darts on one mission, which is, that's pretty cool. I and mean, that's right before I went to Vietnam. Okay, when I, when I, when I first got to Yokota, I, I wanted to, the guys were walking around at Nellis with this 100 mission patch. And I really wanted that 100 mission patch. It, it was one of those goals that I had is, is, to, is to get that 100 mission patch. So when I got to Yokota, I went down to, to personnel and I, and I volunteered for Southeast Asia. And I didn't have a clue at this time. I was the only one that had volunteered to go to Southeast Asia. So in May, I think it was April or May of 67, uh, and like this was right after, right following those dart missions that I had, uh, they got a, a and some, an order to send five guys TDY from Yokota to Takali Air Base to fly combat mission. I was, a fir I was just a lieutenant and I was the first one called up because I was the only one with a volunteer statement. And so then, uh, you know, of course, a lot, there's a lot of guys who wanted to go, they just hadn't thought about putting in a volunteer statement. And so anyway, they filled up real quick. So five of us went down and uh, we went to Takali and I wound up going to the 357th Squadron. It was the 355th Wing at Takali and the 357th Squadron. And got to fly with some really, really great guys. And then this this is where this is where the rubber meets the road, as the saying goes. And once again, this is where my six months of experience with the 105 really, really, really paid off. Because I knew the airplane extremely well. Because like I said, Spiels had pushed me. So I, I was able to assimilate into that role pretty quickly and effectively. They didn't, nobody had to worry about where I was. I was always going to be where I was supposed to. I was going to do what I was supposed to do. And because I knew the rules and I knew why the rules were there. And that's part of the training that I had gotten. And so start flying the first 10 missions you you fly it, they they get you easy missions the lower route packs or or, or even, i even had some laos missions which we weren't in but i had some laos missions anyway those blue jays are really raising the cane back there uh but uh then then you start flying route pack six now route pack six was not a friendly place to be because they had more guns, missiles than uh, anything from what I've been told by the old heads that we ever faced. And the flak sometimes would really be horrendous. The one, one mission, it, it was sort of interesting, oh actually, because when I first started flying, the Pac-6 missions, the guns were quiet. I couldn't believe it. You know, we'd roll on the target. I was expecting all this, this stuff to come up, nothing. And then July, I think 4th or 5th came along. And we're going against Kep Airfield. And I'm flying, I think, in the second flight. Bob White 
was leading, he flew with our, our squadron actually, and he was leading the force in against Kep Airfield, which is on the Northeast Railroad, which is northeast of Hanoi. That's why they call it Northeast Railroad. And uh, anyway, uh, we roll in, and all of a sudden I see something I hadn't seen before, and these red streaks were going by my cockpit. And I, I, I was, I, I, it took a, a little bit for me to realize that's flak. It hadn't gone off yet. That's the flak going up. And then this horrendous explosion took place right underneath me. And I mean, it literally, I'm in a 45 degree dive and I was doing the 550 knots. It literally, it was like somebody took you and hit the, you in the back as hard as you could. And it's just, I mean, it, the whole airplane just completely just moved and it rolled me upside down. Here I am going straight 45 degrees down at the ground, upside down now, and I, I thought I'd been hit. I mean, there was no doubt in my mind that I'd been hit, and I checked my gauges real quick, and this is where, knowing the airplane, I, everything felt solid. And so I, I kept the roll going, and I rolled it out, I checked the gauges real quick, and everything was still in the green. And so I continued, I dropped, came off the target, and. Uh, I looked up and I saw a sight that I'll never forget. One of the guys on the first flight had been hit in the belly. We had a belly tank and fuel was just pouring out and he was a ball of fire all the way, way back. And uh, give me a second. Anyway, I, I, I pulled up beside him, and he, he, was, he had a real, real high angle attack, was climbing, and this fire was just pouring out of his, the back of his airplane. I pulled up alongside of him, and, I, and I, I, I didn't know for sure who it was, but I said, I'm out here to the left of you. I'm out to the left of you. You've been hit. Lower your nose. You've got too high an angle attack. You're going to lose it. Lower your nose. And the nose came down a little bit, and he said, it's getting sloppy. I heard him say it over the air. And I said, try to head a little bit, bring it over to the left more. And he said, I, I can't hardly see this, too much smoke. I said, roll a little bit left, roll left. Trying to get him out to the seat. Try to get him out where he, he could have a chance maybe to, to get out of the airplane. And he, he sort of rolled, but then he said, I'm, I'm starting to lose it, I'm starting to lose it. And I said, well, don't let the, don't, get out of it before you lose it, because what would happen if you got an angle attack in the 105, if you got a high angle attack, the nose would just slam down like this, and then you, when you punch, you're off the seat, and that seat comes up and hits you, but it can really hurt you bad. So I was trying to, keep, it was obvious he was gonna bail out. So I said, get out of it before you lose it. Well. So anyway, he, he leaves the airplane. So I went on, went back, I joined up with the tanker, get home, and I, the crew chief, of course, they'd come up on the airplane and say, how'd it go? And I said, well, check the belly. I, I, I might have taken a hit, and he's, he checked it, and he said, yeah, there's a, there's a hole in the bottom of the airplane. And uh, after, after that guy had gotten hit, two other guys went, hit, got hit. So we lost three guys on that mission. And, uh, the guy that, that I, I tried to help was Ward Dodge, and he was basically my mentor when I showed up in the 357th Squadron. He's the one that, that taught me how to fly combat. And uh, from that point forward, flak was the name of the game. and. Uh, we had a lot of it, lost a lot of guys. In fact, the 105 community on the D model was a single seat version. We lost half the fleet of D models uh, over there. And uh, that, that, just, that just came to be part of the game and uh, you dealt with it. That's, that's what you do. When we started flying, you got to remember it was it was a graduated process, and so the higher ups I don't know whether this part of it was the military side or the civilian side, but they divided North Vietnam into what they call root packs. 
starting from the DMZ, which was the dividing point for South Vietnam and North Vietnam. They started working their way north. Route Pack 1 was right there north of the DMZ, then 2, then 3, 4, 5, and 6. 6 was the entire Hanoi uh, Haiphong area. They further divided Route Pack 6, which was absolutely the worst place to fly, into A and B. The Air Force had A and the Navy had B. So ours was 6A missions, for instance. When, they, when, they, when we get a frag, the frag would be the orders for the next day. It would always have three targets, primary, secondary, and alternate. We, <laughs> it's, it's, it was sort of, sort of funny because we were starting to get frags that come down 6A, 6A, 6A. So no matter what you did, you weren't going to get an easy one out of it. You were going somewhere up in Hanoi. And... Uh, so it was, it was sort of a standing joke, really. Well, at least our alternate is 6A today. and Because uh, a lot of times you'd go up there and the weather would be bad and you, you wouldn't necessarily get a, a, count, you know, get a mission in if the weather was bad when you got up there. Because we had to have VFR conditions. We didn't do IFR bombing. And so everything was visual. Um, but Hanoi Pack 6A, obviously, like I said earlier, that's where the guns, the missiles, and the MiGs were, were operating. No, no, I, you, you, you want to get me mad, huh? <laughs> no, I, I'm, I'm just saying that this is one of the things that we had to deal with that was difficult to accept. Everybody and their damn brother knew when the North Vietnamese had a bombing halt, all they were going to do is renew, rearm, and up the ante. They'd bring in more missiles. They would better disguise their gun sights. They would have opportunity to, for the MiG drivers to train more, because we basically had air superiority up there. They didn't have a chance to fly a whole lot when we were around. And they chose not to until basically August 23rd, uh, 1967. Uh, that was the first time that they really started, came up and played during the time I was there now. I'm not speaking about before I got there. But they, they basically weren't, they weren't able to come in, um, into the, uh, they, come up and fight that much because they just were so outnumbered. Uh, but we had to live with these bombing halls and fortunately I will admit I personally was not involved in a bombing halt. The bombing halts took place before and after my time there. So I, I personally wasn't one of those that, was, that could really throw up the anger from allowing them to build up while I was sitting on the ground, waiting for them to finish building up, then be told to go back up there. Uh, but that's what would take place. And, and they, they took full advantage of increasing their defenses every single time. And it was stupid, absolute stupid. You know, every, anybody that has any a brain of sense is, if you're going to go into combat, if you decide to go to war, then there's only one decision. Kick ass and take names and get the hell out of there. Now, you've got to give Bush credit for that. When we went over to, to Iraq, what, whatever the reasons were, we went in there in six days, it was done. It's a done deal. In our case, we couldn't even touch Haiphong Harbor. The ships would be sailing in and out of Haiphong Harbor. This is when I was there in 67. They'd be sailing in and out of that damn harbor bringing in guns, missiles, fuel, you name it. We couldn't touch it. And all of our, quote, allies, the French and everybody else were also sailing in and out of Haiphong Harbor. I say the French, I, I, I've been told that. Now, I didn't see any French ships, but I have been told that they were coming in and out of there as well. And so I, I better back up on that statement. But they, were, they, they had total immunity. And our government would not even allow us to hit any of the ships. They wouldn't even blockade it and say, all right, guys, we're not going to destroy any of these ships, but you're not coming in there. You're not bringing the stuff in. They wouldn't even stop it. And that's where I, I, I have a hatred for Johnson and McNamara that will, the only t day it will die is the day that I die. There I was, 40,000 feet, 
pulling nine G's going to Mach 2, the 105. No, not quite. First of all, uh, I, I, there, there, is, there is something I will add before I got to the mix because the mix situation actually occurred because of this, this uh, okay. thing I'm going to tell you about. I was down TDY, Takali. I had 45 missions and orders came in sending the five of us back to Yokota and then there was another five going to come down to take our place at Takali. That all made perfect sense to everybody except for David B. Colonel Trays, who was my squadron commander at Nellis when I checked out in the F-105, had taken over a squadron at Karat, which is our sister F-105 wing. And he was the boss of the 44th Tactical Fighter Squadron. Well, I went down there to get my 100 mission patch. I think I mentioned that earlier. Well, I pick up the telephone and I call Colonel Trays. I say, hey, Colonel Trays, this is, this is Dave Walter. Because we'd seen each other a lot because we, we had single runways at both Takali and Karat. So sometimes somebody would blow a tire, foul the runway, and they, we'd have to divert, you know, them coming to Takali, us going to Karat. So, we, you know, we, we, I, I ran into Colonel Trays a couple of times. But anyway, I, so I told him, I said, this is David B. over here, or David B. Walter. I, did, I just said Dave Walter. And uh, I said, they're sending, I'm down here TDY from, from Yokota, which you, know, you knew about that. And I said, well, they're sending me home. I want to stay down here and get my 100. Do you need any experienced driver? I got 45 missions, 30 of them in pack six. And he said, get your fucking skinny ass over here. I'll take care of the paperwork. Now, you're going to have to edit that, but that's just what he said, and I'm not going to change it. And so I said, yes, sir. I packed my bags. Nobody had a clue. What I had done, I didn't tell anybody because I didn't even think about it. He was going to take care of the paperwork. So, because we were all, they were giving us a leeway, a little bit of time, you know, between leaving Thailand and getting back to Yakota anyway. So I, anyway, I packed my bag and I hop on a C-130 over about 100 miles to the east of me and I land and I started flying the next day. And uh, the only thing is, as I found out later, Colonel Trey's hadn't taken care of the paperwork. So I'm over there without orders, just lying my ass off. And I mean, I, I started flying immediately because he was, he had, he had lost some guys and then some guys had finished up and got their hunters. So he was short handed, especially experienced drivers. And when, when you, like I was mentioning earlier, our frags were starting to come down six, six, six. So that's where we were going. And they, you don't want to take a brand new guy into Hanoi because my gosh, anything in the world can happen. And the, the rest cap, if somebody gets shot down, knowing who to call, how to call, how to rest cap the guy, who to stay over him, who to go hit the tanker and cycle. So you, there's a lot goes on on a rest cap. And uh, first of all, in the Hanoi area, generally you're not even going to do a rest cap. That's the really, that's the, the hard hitting line on this whole thing is if you're in the Hanoi area, nobody's going to be able to come in and pick you up. If you can get out to sea, if you can get out to the west, to the, to the mountains, to Laos or someplace like that, yeah, then, then we'll try to get you out of there. And I've been involved in a, in a few of the rest caps myself. But uh, that's why you didn't want a brand new guy just in the theater going downtown Hanoi because it was, there was a lot going on up there. I mean, it, it's, you got to be flying your airplane. And so anyway, uh, I immediately started flying and it, it, full tilt, Hanoi, when I, as soon as I got to Karat. And uh, then, it, of course, the first thing Colonel Dres did with my background, he made me a, 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 a section leader, which is number, you know, I could fly three and four, lead for three and four. When I soon as I walked in the door, in fact, my very, very first mission was the first strike on the Demer Bridge. He put me as number three. And then we got on the tanker and lead, which was Major Bill Rate, I think it was. He couldn't take gas. And Major Rate said, Dave, you got more experience than anybody else in the flight. You got to lead. My very first flight, my very first flight at Karat, I led a, a flight downtown Hanoi. So that, that was 
that, and that's a lot that goes on when you're a lead. But anyway, I, I, what I'm saying is, I, I, I was I was a section uh, full time, and so August 23rd was perhaps. And this will take a little bit of time to describe this because it really was the most involved and complicated mission that actually I, I flew in uh, the Hanoi area. We were going against a big railroad yard which is right across the Red River from Hanoi, right across the northeast side of, uh, of Hanoi was, was a, a railroad yard called Yen Vin Railroad Yard. It's a big target, so we had our typical four flights of 105, a flight being four airplanes, for those of you that are not familiar with that. So a flight is four airplanes, so we had four flights of strike aircraft. They're all single-seaters, and so that's 16 airplanes. Then we had a flight of weasel airplanes. They come in and snoop out the missiles, the radars, and those, that was a flight of four. So we had five flights of 105s up there. Well, it was such a big target that uh, the Air Force also attached two F-4 strike flights from Ubon of F-4s. And they got behind our flight. So we had six strike flights coming in on this target. Now, we all come up come in pretty much together because we had what they call these little whizzies, these little these devices that would help blank out the, the SAM uh, missile radars. So we all came in together in a, in a what they call a pod formation back then. Then Robin Oles, a flight of four, was flying MIG cap to keep the MIGs off of us. And up to this point, like I think I mentioned earlier, there hadn't been any MIG activity to speak of. So we're heading up there, and we drop off the tanker, which you always, you, you refueled when you're on a Paxis mission. You always refuel going in and coming off. So we, you got pretty proficient at refueling airplanes. You can do it almost in your sleep. And so whereas we're coming up there, our, we had some Snoopy airplanes out off the coast that had what we, we call them Big Eye. And they, could, they had radar coverage of North Vietnam and especially Hanoi when we were going in. They started calling bandits, bandits, bullseye. That means MiGs taking off Hanoi, bullseye being Hanoi. MiGs are taking off in the Hanoi area. So I said, whoa, that's something different. And so they start tracking them, and they're we're coming in that afternoon from the west. Sometimes we'd come in from the ocean, uh, the Gulf, and sometimes, most of the time, we came in from land over on the Laos side. And we were coming over from Laos that day. So we came up. There's a big ridge called Thud Ridge, which basically ran northeast, I mean, uh, yeah, southeast. Uh, northwest and it ran toward Hanoi and almost pointed right at Hanoi. So we were going around the north side of that and as we're starting to t get our track the call outs for the MiGs and their position and their headings were it was obvious and by the way this was an afternoon sortie. Where's the sun in the afternoon? It's in the west. It's in the lower part of the west. And what the MiGs were doing is they were going out to the west, then they were going to turn and come in out of the sun where we could not see them. And that's one of the, that goes all the way back to the earliest combat airplanes, is you always try to come out of the sun if you're going to attack somebody. And that's what they were doing. They were MiG-21s. And... So they came from the west, and so the force commander, and I can't remember his name right now, who was leading the whole force in, he said, Robin, make sure you keep those guys off of us. And Robin says, we're working, and we're trying to find them right now. Well, this is one of those cases where the MiGs won out, and they came out of the sun. They were doing 1.2 Mach. Now, that 1.2 Mach is 1.2 times the speed of sound, speed of sound being 760 miles an hour at sea level. Now, at altitude, it's less, so they were probably doing close to... Oh, maybe six, seven, eight hundred miles an hour. 
So they're they're moving on, and they're and they're if you look at a MiG-21 head-on, there's not much to see. It's a very very small profile. The wings, the intake, it's not a lot of airplane if you're looking at it head-on. So they're very very difficult to see. And they were they did it right. I mean these guys they did it right. I got to give them credit. They came in, they and they launched off two of their atolls. An atoll is a heat seeker heat-seeking missile just like our Sidewinder same deal and they knocked two F4s down right behind my flight remember I said something about luck and they were right behind my flight and had they not been there who knows uh, but they they caught the brunt of the mix and they knocked two of them down and so now we got mayday calls beepers when you when you bail out an airplane, or I bail out, you don't bail out, you eject. When you eject out of an airplane, you got this beeper that goes up. It sort of makes it sound like a whoa, 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 whoa. And you can hear it over guard frequency, which everybody monitors. So we got all these beepers going off. We got mayday calls. You're on fire. Get out of it. All this stuff, all this crap's going on. We're still heading for the target. We ain't got there yet. And so Robin gets tied up trying to help these guys. And of course, you're not, like I mentioned earlier, there is no rest cap in the area we were now in you just don't even it's, it's you're on your own because the, the helicopters they can't get in there it's just too, too heavily defended so we press on this is what you do you just that's what you do you don't sit there and just everybody say oh i'm going home you keep on trucking doing what your mission is that's what we're that's what we're paid to do that's what we signed up for and by the way speaking of signing up for every one of us flying fighters we volunteered to fly fighters and this was a big distinction between myself ourselves and the poor kids down in South Vietnam they were drafted they had no choice they they were sent over there to fight a political war and they didn't have a choice about what they did we all put our name on the line voluntarily and I don't know why I, I, that just that just was something I did want to bring out. There's two separate wars, two totally different wars. Our war was was a air to air, air to ground war. Our, it was a sterile war. We never saw faces. We never saw any blood and guts. We saw airplanes. We saw targets. Never saw a face. Those poor kids down there, different ball game. And I don't think anybody that's there, unless they've been through it, including myself, can never appreciate you know, what they were faced with. But getting back to my story. Uh, so we, we press on in. We're going into the target. And I was in, I think ours was the third, ours was, yes, ours was the third flight. Because like I said, we were staggered at the back. And, and the flights are staggered like this. Lee would be here, second flight, third flight, fourth flight, like that. I don't know whether you get that on the camera but otherwise it, anyways and that's why I said if the F4s hadn't been behind me then I would have been in line for the MiGs that came in or our, my flight would have been I, I might have been lucky I don't know but uh, we get in the target area we're the third flight in and I now have you know about 600 hours or so in fighters and I'm going in, everything is set, All you, you check your radar, your fire control system going in, you always line up on another airplane just to check, get, your, get everything, make sure everything's working properly. And my, I had a, the 105 had the most sophisticated fire control system of any fighter flying in North Vietnam, period. It, was, it had the latest and greatest, and it worked terrifically, as I described on, on the DART. That was a good example of it. It works especially if you know how to use it and you're smooth. And as I'm turning in, and we're now we're at what's called a push-up point. That's when you leave the cruise mode and now you throttle up and you're picking up to about 550 for your roll in. That's 550 knots, about 650 miles an hour or something like whatever it is. And all of a sudden I'm looking, you have what's called a reticle. It's projected up in front of you. And in our case, it was, it's, a red, it's red rings with a dot in the middle. That's the pipper. The dot is the pipper. And you put that on your target. 
And so I'm just trucking along, everything's looking great, and all of a sudden, my reticle goes, and it's gone. <laughs> and so I didn't think anything about it at the time, because I mean, we're, we're about 15, 20 seconds from rolling, and the last thing in the world you're gonna do is try to start screwing around with stuff and see if you can figure out how to get it back. But, and I didn't really know for sure what was, what was wrong. And so I said, well, I've, I've done this bombing mission plenty of times, so I can, I can figure it out. You know, it look, I'll use the TLAR method. That looks about right, <laughs> TLAR. And so I rolled in and I, sure enough, I, I used my TLAR and I released my bomb. So I'm coming off and we had pre-briefed to turn hard to the north for our join up, because you always operate as a flight for mutual protection, especially when there's MiGs in the area. And there were MiG 17s all around the target. And, but they, none of them posed a threat to us, so we didn't fool them. We, our job was to bomb the railroad yard. But now I'm coming off, and I'm, I'm pulling about six Gs, coming off the target, doing about 600 or so knots. And I'm back out of burner, because you want to save your gas. Uh, you don't want to. But I'm still doing 600 knots. 105 is fast. That thing was just so beautifully fast. Uh, and I look up, though, as I'm making my turn to join up with the flight, and I see an F-105 heading west. He's got two MiG-17s right on his butt. The lead MiG is, is directly in trail with the, with the 105. The second MiG was off to lead MiGs right side and staggered aft and i saw that and then i saw the fire coming out of the mig's nose he was actually was shooting at the 105 and so i hollered out over the radio because i didn't have a clue who the 105 was i just said 105 heading west you got two mig's on your ass do something and he just kept on going he probably didn't hear it or he'd already switched over to a different frequency which we normally did We'd go to squadron common because there's so much chatter. If you're trying to join a flight up, it's really difficult with all that, because you can't, you can't talk over somebody else. So we, you'd switch immediately over to squadron common. So that's probably why he didn't hear me and I, you know, I didn't hear him or whatever. And so then I, I made my decision. I had to go in and get these MIGs off his tail or he was gonna be dead or at least shot down. And so I hit what's called a panic button. There's a button over on the right side of the cockpit. And when you push this button, it cleans everything off the airplane except the outboard stations. And on, since I was flying number three, I had a Sidewinder on my left station. Sidewinder, once again, is a heat-seeking missile that you can use in an air-to-air -air environment. And so I had that, and I, I just I pushed the nose over and lit the afterburner to, to accelerate as quick as I could. I, I went down, I, I lowered my nose so I could pick up speed as quick as I could and also to go more, because it was almost like this and I wanted to get more in trail. So I went low and down so I could come up below them so they couldn't see me coming. And that all worked. I mean, I, I got that down pretty good. And when I, the last thing I saw though, when I started my pull, I looked at my airspeed indicator and I was doing about 1.3 Mach. That's 1.3 times the speed of sound. I mean, I'm smoking. But for a good reason, because th that MiG is still shooting at the 105. How he had missed him up to this point, I will never to this day know. Because he was dead trail. The 105 did not know he was there. He was just going straight and level. He was only doing about 400 knots because the MiG didn't even have his afterburner on. And the MiGs had afterburners if they, if they needed the extra speed. He didn't even have it on it. So the guy was just was doing breaking all the rules number one coming off the target you got the throttle up you're hauling ass and you got the stick in your lap and you're moving the airplane it was called we we call it jinking you just you constantly do this and what you're doing is two things if somebody is back there you're killing their tracking solution and number two you're looking you're looking for other MIGs because also you are in charge of helping defend your own flight so you want to see if there's a threat somewhere in your back, some back, back that you don't, you can't, that's not in front of you. And so you're really looking hard. And so I'm, I'm, I came off that target. I was doing, pulling six, six and a half Gs. And I, you know, doing this when I saw what was going on. So this guy's just going straight and level, the 105. So I, I, then I, I come up and my sidewinder is on 
and it's growling. Uh, growling audio means it's got to lock on to a heat signature. The heat is coming from the back of the airplane. That's where the engine exhaust comes out. So it's looking at a heat source. The lead MIG was so close to the 105, though, I didn't know whether the Sidewinder was looking at the 105 or whether it was looking at the MIG, which would have been great if I could discriminate, but I couldn't. And I didn't have my sight, damn it. And so I couldn't really, you know, I, I didn't have all that working for me. And so I decided I could never live with myself if I had turned that Sidewinder loose and it had gone to the 105. I, I, I would, I don't know what I would have done. I, I, could, I could never have accepted that ever. And so I turned the volume down on, on the missile and I said, well, I got to go in with a gun. Well, remember earlier I was talking about that thing, that round thing with a pepper in the middle of it? Well, that's what you use if you're going in air to air wise to shoot at another airplane. So I didn't have that, but I said, well, you know, I've shot the gun. It's somewhere out there, somewhere in the middle. <laughs> <laughs> and so I came up and I, I, I went after the second mil, MIG first because I didn't want to go past him for the lead MIG because then the second MIG would have a good shot at me. So I had to be smart and just try to bust these guys up. And so I went after the second MIG and actually that's when I realized how fast I really was going. I, I'd seen my airspeed indicator, but I realized how slow they were going. That's a better way to put it is because I, all of a sudden I started seeing this closure and I realized I am really closing fast. And so I, I opened up on the second trailing MIG and, and I did a rake and I thought I saw flashes on his left wing. And now I'm pulling, I did about a six or seven G pull vertical to stay behind these guys because the 105 is not a turning airplane. So I had to really crank to stay behind him, which I did and I go up through a broken layer of clouds and I'm sitting up upside down just just floating there like this up literally upside down and all of a sudden underneath this broken layer of clouds out comes this MiG-17. Now this one had his afterburner going. That's the difference. The other two did not have their burner going. So I don't know whether it was one of those guys, another guy, or if if after I came through and, and, and I got him off this 105's tail then they lit their afterburner to get some speed that might be what happened. I'll never know. Nobody will know. But I, then I, I saw that, and so I said, oh, my gosh. And so I pulled down, and I mean, he did not know I was there. So he's just driving straight, and he's, he's trying to get his speed up. Well, he's, he's dealing with a speed demon when you're talking about a 105, because we were the fastest thing below 10,000 feet and, and flying. And so I, I, I came right down on top of him, and I opened up and the first bullets went right through the cockpit. Then started working down the side of the airplane. And I did not realize this at the time, but while I'm actually hitting the MiG, a 105 actually came between myself and the MiG. He was slightly low, but apparently I had, I'm hitting the MiG right as he passes directly between us. And a drop around, must have hit one of his tanks because a big ball of fire comes out from this 105. But all the 105s got home the day, that day. That was the best part of this whole deal because you don't really, in, in, our, in our world up there, our environment, you really don't have a chance to ever save somebody else's life. Because the opportunities, I mean, when you're dealing with Flack and Sam's, there's nothing you can do. You can't go over there and help a guy with his airplane. You know, it's his ride. And there's nothing you can do to help him. So if you get hit by, me, or by Flack or Sam's, then, then you're on your own. But in this particular case, I was able to get there, clean these MiGs off this guy's tail, and every 105 got home that day. And... Uh, the, the, the only thing is, and this, is, this may be hard for some people to comprehend, considering the hostilities and the, and the environment that we were operating in, we still had a, it, it, a code of ethics. I, I, there's probably a better choice of words. I don't have it at 
at my grasp right now. But if I had had the site that was working, and since he didn't know I was there, I would have probably gone for his engine or one of his wings. I would not have gone for him personally. And in fact, when I got back to Karat, the first thing everybody, they, you, everybody's seen the, the, the movie Top Gun. And you know, when, when, when the guys land uh, on, the, on the carrier deck, everybody's around them. You know? Well, actually, I have a picture of that, and that same thing happened to me. But the first thing everybody asked, did he get out? And I had to say, no, he didn't get out. Because everybody respected the fact that he was another kid uh, or guy who... who was doing what he loved to do, and he was, in his own way, protecting his country. So he wasn't, he wasn't like, it wasn't personal to me. But, so I would have not gone for the cockpit. But I didn't have the sight, so you know, I had no choice. I, just, I, just, I did what I had to do. And I, I, w I wouldn't change anything, but I regret that the guy didn't get out. The epitome in combat for any fighter pilot is to take an opportunity to engage an enemy airplane, in our case a MiG, and to actually accomplish the task of shooting it down. I mean, that's, it's, it sort of puts you into another group and no there weren't that many now and I want, I want I do want to say this I went there were two MiGs when I got back to Karat I claimed a kill I knew I had this guy I didn't know whether it was I didn't know whether I got the first guy or not and to this day I, and I'm just for the record I, I'm just I've said this before I don't know for sure what took place but what did take place is, and the reason the wing gave me credit for two, and the official Air Force record is only one, but they all they had to go on was film documentation, I guess. But that night, <laughs> I'm gonna have to really doctor this up because uh, the actual language that took place, I don't think I can quite, uh, maybe I can bleep it. <laughs> That night, we're, we're getting ready to do our mass debrief. The mass debrief, when, when you go to Hanoi, when you come back, all the flights get together. In one room, force commander stands up in front of all of us. We're all in the room, and the, the intelligence officers in there, the wing commander, the vice wing commander, everybody, you know, all, a lot of the squadron commanders would come in because they want to know what took place if they weren't on the mission, because not everybody is on every mission. And so this was a big one, though. And so it, the room was pretty full. So the, the force commander's up there getting ready to start, and he starts talking about some of the stuff that took place. Well, the sergeant comes in, and we're down at where all the intelligence people were also located. And uh, I think they were in the same building. But anyway, the sergeant comes in, and uh, there's, I think the our intelligence officer was a major. He said, Major, umpty up, we got a, a call from Ubon. And so he, it, this guy says, could you hold, hold the brief till I get back? So we'd all just sort of milling around, standing around, talking. And uh, so pretty, pretty soon he comes in. He's, he had this funny look on his face. He said, uh, Lieutenant Walter, no, what, what? You, you, you claim you got one MiG. I said, yes, sir. That's what I, I claimed I got one MiG. I, I know it because I saw him hit the ground. Well, that was, that was Colonel Olds. And he just called and he, he wanted to speak to me. And he's, when I got on the phone, he said, who is this? And I identified myself as Major Umpium. And he said, well, this is, this is Colonel Olds, Old Uban, and I want to confirm some a kill for one of your guys over there flying thuds. It was, and it, it's in that letter. He said it was, it absolutely was the most spectacular thing he had seen in that whole tour he had over there. A little while later, uh, 
I got a letter from Robin, and because the, they were going to have the review board, and one of the guys that was on it, uh, in fact, it was uh, Bob White, actually told me about the review board coming up. He said, if you got any kind of documentation, you might want to try to get it down there because all they got it to go on is just strictly right now the film, so forth. Anyway, so I, I, I contacted Colonel Lowell's then. And so he wrote me this letter and it says, Dear Lieutenant Walter, here's my observation. Based on vivid recollection, Passed it on to the 7th Air Force, and they, they were the ones that were going to do the review and so forth. And, and finally, let me know, and he said, if that doesn't work, let me know and I'll redo this. So anyway, he said, as far as I'm concerned, you got the first MiG without any shadow of a doubt. As to the second, the film showed hits. What happened after that will require confirmation by you and anyone else in 388 that saw it or saw a shoot. Which, of course, like I said, nobody else saw the engagement except Robin. And... The man didn't get out of the airplane. And remember, I saw no shoot connected with that first MiG. None of our tr troops went down in the vicinity that day. So if anyone saw a shoot north or northwest of Fukien, it had to be your second MiG. And may I say in passing, and this is the neat part, may I say in passing that the sight of your thud hot on the tail of a MiG-17 shooting like hell and scary, scoring hits was one of the most thrilling sights in my whole tour. You look like a shark after a minnow. By the way, that, after that, I, I wound up with a call sign, it was shark. And I still use, I mean, I still get called shark today. Uh, shark after a minnow. I couldn't help shouting, you go get them, thud, breach of radio discipline, I know, but it was a beautiful moment. All the best to you and good luck with your claims board. And it says, hell, we fighter jocks know you did it. Never fear and have fun in the F-4. Because I was telling him that since I was, uh, we lost our thuds at Yokota, that we were going to pick up F-4. So that's where he was coming from on that. It's not a bad bird at that. Robin Olds. I know he did not want to leave. He, 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 in fact, I remember talking to him after I got to know him. And he said, you know, I, I, I didn't really want to get my fifth kill because they would have pulled me and I still had work to do. That's exactly the words he used. He said I had, still had work to do. He was, he was the real deal. I mean, he, he was probably, and, and I will take nothing away from our leadership because we were lucky. God, I, I flew with some of the greatest leadership and commanders, and, and I think about the leadership we got in this country today uh, up in Washington, and I think about the difference between those guys and the real deal, the guys that were doing, were leading us, that were actually feet on the ground uh, with us. And when I, I, that's not really true, feet in the air. Uh, those guys were the real deal as far as leadership. The guys, bozos in Washington, they don't have a clue. But uh, he was probably, in really getting to know Robin after the fact, knowing about him through his peers, the people that actually flew with him, that were in, with him at Ubon. He was probably the finest combat commander that the Air Force has ever had. I, I, I think I could go out on a limb and say that because not only was he the epitome of a jock, a fighter jock, he was a leader. When he walked in the room, there was no doubt who was in charge. You knew immediately who was in charge. And for those guys that got to fly with him, when he was in charge, they had that warm, fuzzy feeling. This guy knows what he's doing and he's gonna take care of us. Like, like if, if he hadn't just been where he was, nobody else in my flight even saw me tangle up with him. I was solo as far as everybody in the 105, nobody in the 105 community even saw what took place. He just happened to see it. So it's not something that, that, and it happens so fast. Uh, these engagements don't last. Uh, I mean, in, in the movies you see these games where they just go, oh, this is not, it doesn't work like that. Not, not in our environment with the fighters and the speeds that we were dealing with. Because first of all, normally, anybody that would have had any sense would have boogied out of there and, but in my case, for some stupid reason, I was hanging upside down. I was looking around, don't get me wrong, I was still clearing my six. 
but I was just happened to be upside down when I saw this other MiG. Normally, it, the environment we were operating in, you're not going to hang around. That, that's just that's not very good for your health. And uh, so that just happened. I, I don't know if it's single other confirmation by some other pilot, really. I, I'm sure it may have taken place. I'm just saying I don't know of any. And uh, so, that, but it was special because I did get to know Robin uh, through an organization called Red River Valley Fighter Pilots Association. The very first one uh, I, I, I attended in the, when it was back in the States. It was at Wichita, Kansas at McConnell. And one of the guys asked, you know, knew of that, that deal and he said, have you ever met Robin? I said, no, is he here? And he said, yeah, let me go introduce you to him. So I, I met him and, and I mean, it was, it was great. It was just awesome. It, he, he was, he was a, a bigger than life guy. And I mean, he just lit up like a, like a Christmas tree. So you're the guy. He stuck out his big paw. <laughs> It's cool. And, uh, but anyway, I, I got to talk to him several times, and then I got to know him through some friends of mine as well. And so, uh, but he, he, was, he was really a super guy. Uh, he's, he's, I think he's probably the only guy that ever took on the President of the United States. Well, uh, on October 28th, just to make sure that there wasn't anything that flying in a combat environment uh, might have to offer. Uh, we, were, we took off on an early, early mission. We were going downtown Hanoi, I mean, as in two miles southeast of Hanoi on a target. And uh, we took off before sunrise. The sun started coming up right as we, we were flying. We were heading to the east, so that means in a, in a in a fighter, you're flying formation, remember, and it's, it's, you know, you got lead, three, four, two. It's like that, and you're flying, and you're flying sort of a loose formation. You're not flying tight, so you just relax. And, but we're, but the sun's in your eyes. Well, when the sun's in your eyes, you really can't see any lights in your cockpit. And as, as a wingman, which I, I was flying off the lead because I was flying number three, you know, I'd, I'm looking over there. I'm not looking at anything in my cockpit anyway. And so finally we get ready to turn south to join up with the tanker. Well, when we turn south, all of a sudden I see this master caution light on in the cockpit. And I said, where'd that come from? And so in the 105, you had the master caution light and you had a warning light. Well, this was a master caution. And, but it, then it takes you over to a panel that has a series of system lights. And one was lit up and it said, all quantity. Well, when you take off, you're always above a half, more like three quarters to full on the all quantity. Mine was at a half, because the light was on, it said all quantity, well, we have a gauge as well. So there's a lot of redundancy there. And so I looked down at my gauge and sure enough, it's at half. And so I called that out to lead and I said, I've got a master caution that's saying oil quantity and I'm sitting on a half right now. And he said, well, keep an eye on it. If it drops, get, it, get out of here and try to get to Uborn, uh, Udorn, which was the closest base at the time. And sure enough, I saw it and it, it, was, it was just creeping down. So I told him, I said, hey, this thing is, I'm, I'm losing this oil. And he said, hey, head for Udorn, take four with you as a chase. So we peel out. And so, head off to Udorn, which is about 30 miles away. Well, I was loaded down, of course, I still had fuel in my tanks, still had a load of bombs, and there was, it was still dark down below us. And so I could see a bunch of little lights from the villages and everything, and I didn't want to get rid of that stuff, and I needed to get rid of it because it's drag. I wanted to be able to stretch the range as much as I could on that airplane in case I lost my oil. And so there was a range of mountains that uh, as I told Number, number four, I said, I'm going to head over here so I can get rid of this, this ordinance over these mountains, try to stretch my range a little bit. So I started turning, and it's, and it's, it's like I could, all of a sudden I started feeling this. You can, probably can't see it on the film, but I'm shaking my hand, and there's this vibration just started setting in on the airplane. Now, by this, oh, by the, this time, the oil quantity had completely dropped out to zero. 
So I had no more oil left. And normally the procedure is set the throttle at about 87% and you don't, you don't leave it. And that's where they say you're gonna get the best range out of the engine when you lose your oil. So I'm going over this, this mountain race, trying to get where I can punch all this, this uh, ordnance and crap off the airplane. And about halfway around there, the vibration is, 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 is just like you took a volume knob and just slowly turned it up. And the vibration kept getting stronger and stronger and stronger and stronger. And so I called out to number four, the chase me. I said, this, the vibration is really picking up in this thing. And he said, yeah, you got, you're smoking pretty good too. And I said, I don't know for sure I'm going to make it. I'm going to try to get over these mountains though this airplane and it finally got I got around to where I was over the mountains and I was going to punch the stuff off the vibration had gotten so violent that I was literally as strong as the 105 was and it was a really really well built strong it probably took more battle damage from flak and, and stuff than any airplane flying and I knew it was a strong airplane but I literally I couldn't read a single instrument in the cockpit I mean, it was just it was just a blur. Everything was a blur, and I, it, and I said, "This thing, I'm I'm losing. It. I'm probably going to get out of it." And he said, "Well, I don't doubt that. You ought to see the back of your airplane. It's like Fourth of July is coming early." And I said, "What do you mean?" He said, "You ought to see the shit flying out of the back of your airplane." And so I said, "Yeah, that's it." And I said, "I popped the rat. A rat is a ram air turbine. It's a little propeller that falls out once you turn it loose. It falls out of the side of the airplane." It's got a propeller that starts spinning up, and that will provide you with uh, a generator to, so you continue to commu communicate, as well as it'll provide hydraulic pressure to run your flight controls if you lose your engine, because your engine is run from a hydraulic pump, or, or the hydraulic pump is run from the engine, and that's what provides the pressure for the flight controls. So anyway, that, that, that allowed me to talk and to uh, <clears throat> fly the airplane. So I said, I'm shutting this damn thing down before it comes apart. And I did. I stopped cocked. And now I'm in the world's biggest, heaviest glider. And a glider in a 105 is like a rock falling. So you're not going to go very far. And so uh, he said, well, make sure you get out plenty of time. I said, I'm going to get out about eight, ten thousand. 10,000. And so sure enough, went down, pulled that handle up, pulled that trigger, and wow. And it squeezed the thing, and that rocket, well, the rocket doesn't fire at first. It was a shell that initially sends you up the track. It's got a, a cable that's actually attached to the rocket, because if the rocket fires, it's, it could burn your, your feet and your legs and stuff. So anyway, went up. That thing went off, and what a ride that was. And I've still got neck and back issues to this day from that, as a matter of fact. Uh, but, you know, everything worked. I floated my parachute. I landed in a big old tree, one of the, I think one of the biggest trees in Thailand or at least the tallest. And I'm up here and I'm looking around and we got one of these repelling devices and I, I started to use that thing and I said, damn, I'm not sure that'll reach the ground. And of course, as a kid, I used to climb trees like every other kid did. So I said, you know, up there, naturally, the tree wasn't that big. So I pulled myself, I, I could pull myself over this branch of this tree. I climb out, I turn loose my parachute and I start climbing down this damn tree. And I get down the last part of about probably about the last six or eight feet of the tree. It's so damn big. I got my arms spread as wide as I could. And I don't have any grip anymore. I'm sliding down. The only scratch I got were my forearms where I slid down this damn tree. <laughs> and anyway, number four, he got the helicopter. They came in, picked me up, and, and took me back to uh, Udorn. And then I hopped on another flight back to Karat. They, they, they check you over, and the doctor, you know, goes over everything, asks you how you're doing, all this kind of stuff. And uh, so anyway, they take me back to Karat and, uh, oh, I, f I forgot to mention something earlier. Remember me talking about, because this came into play, uh, about not having orders sending me to Karat? Well, Yakota found out where I was on August 23rd. I had been missing since about the 12th of August when I went from Takali to Karad. And then, of course, all the news media splattered that all over everything. That's when they found out that I'd gone to Karad. <laughs> well, what else didn't follow me to Karad was my medical records. 
And so I never even have, even to this day, there's nothing documented in any of my paperwork that I ejected from an airplane. The official Air Force records, at least. <laughs> and funny thing was, I never thought of a thing about it till about, oh, five or six years ago, I was at a, at a river rat reunion and got to talking to one of the guys I was down there with, Dick Gow. And somehow or another that thing came up and he said, by the way, Lieutenant, I got a question to ask you. I mean, that's what he always calls me because he was a captain and I was a lieutenant. And he said, I want to know something. Since when do lieutenants write their own orders? And I looked at him and I didn't have a clue what he was talking about. I just, just didn't, didn't register. I, what, are you, what are you talking about, Dick? He said, remember when you went to Croc? I said, yeah. He said, how did you write your own orders? I said, I didn't. I picked up the telephone I called Colonel Trace. And he said, come on over, and I did. And he said, do you realize that you just changed official orders by doing that? And I had never thought a thing about that up to that point in time and space. And I did. I guess I did something that I wrote my own orders over there. Because <laughs> Colonel, Tra Colonel Trace never, never got any orders made up for me. <laughs> oh, well. You know, but, uh, you know, it was... It was, it was a hell of an experience. Uh, it was a hell of an experience. Working with the people I worked with is something I will never ever fail to remember and cherish. These people, these guys, just like the guys in South Vietnam, all of us knew it could be our day, that something wasn't gonna go our way. But yet everybody put their boots on, everybody put their helmet on, they strapped that big beast on, started up, and away we went. And we did our job. And it was frustrating as hell dealing with the leadership that we had that wouldn't support us, that wouldn't allow us to win the war, which we could have done in a damn heartbeat. That leadership would not allow us to do it. Now I'm going to want to go one step further here. I also fought the JCS, the Joint Chiefs of Staff, because every single one of those guys should have gone on and written their careers off and they should have resigned in mass and say, President, we can no longer work for you and the way that you're running this war and squandering our resources and our kids. And I, I, I mean, I hold them responsible for not having the guts to stand up and say, that's it, we can't support you. If that had happened, that whole thing would have changed immediately. I mean, the whole picture would have changed because that, the president could no longer conduct what he was doing, the way he was doing it, had they done that in mass, said, sir, with all due respect, we can no longer perform our jobs. Aviation, the art of aeronautics, began with the dreamers, inventors, and daredevils who dared to defy gravity. The journey of aviation was nurtured by pioneers like the Wright brothers, whose first flight marked a historic milestone. The role of aircrafts in world wars was groundbreaking, dramatically changing warfare strategies. This initiated a technological evolution in aviation, transforming the simplistic wings of a biplane into the thunderous roar of jet engines. Let's journey through the ages of aviation. Behind every great aircraft, there were great minds. These visionaries, like Sir Frank Whittle, the innovator of the turbojet engine, redefined air travel. Then there's Skunk Works' Kelly Johnson, the genius behind the SR-71 Blackbird. His designs combined speed, stealth and power, crafting machines that dominated the heavens. 
The contributions of these pioneers have left an indelible mark on the canvas of aviation, shaping the course of history and inspiring generations of engineers and aviators. Each epoch in aviation history gave birth to extraordinary aircrafts, each with their own unique features and roles. The Lockheed SR-71 Blackbird was a marvel of speed and stealth. The F-105 Thunder Chief, a supersonic fighter bomber, was vital in the Vietnam War. The P-51 Mustang, a long-range fighter, was critical in World War II. The P-47 Thunderbolt, a heavyweight fighter, was used extensively in the same war. The A-10 Thunderbolt II, the Warthog, is a close air support icon. The Messerschmitt ME262 marked a leap forward in aviation technology. Each of these game changers were instrumental in their eras and their legacies still resonate today. Beyond the game changers, there are those that have transcended their practical roles to become icons. The Concorde was not just an aircraft, it was a supersonic symbol of luxury and speed. The B-52 Stratofortress, a strategic bomber, is an icon of power and resilience. These magnificent machines and others like them have become much more than just aircrafts. They are enduring icons that encapsulate the audacious spirit, the relentless innovation and the boundless ambition that define the world of aviation. For more amazing aerial footage and to join us in this incredible journey, check out the Dronescape's YouTube channel. If you enjoyed this video, please remember to like and subscribe. And as always, thank you for watching.